I always feel like Steve Harvey just has like, I don't know him, I've never met him, but he just seems like the type of brother that just travels with fabric. <laughs> and it's just some of in the next hotel room who just <laughs> throw me together something in a 42 long. And then he, I'll be at, I'll be on the golf course and yeah. he light a cigar and then it'd be a new suit yeah. in this hotel room. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Raphael, run out and get some buttons for me. I need a few more buttons. <laughs> <laughs> it's never enough buttons. This is another episode of Stand Up Playback. 30 years of better in the game. The pride of St. Louis. He is said the entertainer. Yeah, yeah. What's up, brother? Now, this is just a random question. Do you decide when you're said the entertainer versus Cedric the entertainer? Because I notice you flip flop it sometimes, depending on the network. Yeah, yeah. You know, it depending and it's depending on the check. You know, the, the <laughs> definitely the check size and the credit I get is, is do you get the whole name? Because I've seen you do some black shit and it's said to entertain it. But then, you know, because right now you're, you're, on, you're in the neighborhood on CBS. Yeah. You're doing the sitcom. Yeah, and it's Cedric. Cedric. Cedric, the entertainer. <laughs> and I've done some things on other networks where I've just said the int. I don't even give you the full entertainer <laughs> at the end. <laughs> they can't even afford all the graphics. Not man. the whole well, thing. I want to tell you what an honor it is to sit down with you. You know, you're one of the OGs in the game. And that goes without saying your, your pedigree, your resume, runs as deep as black comedy, as far as I'm concerned, you know, and that's from the Def Jam era all the way up to where we are now. And I think that something that people just don't notice because you do it so easily is that you don't have a career of three, three plus decades without evolving, without being able to have a sense of relatability to the generation that's coming after you. Was it deliberate in your intention, in the persona that you created on stage, to feel like the one Black relative that everybody either knows or has? There's a familiarity yeah. with you. Even if someone doesn't know you, they know someone like you. How much of that was persona versus, like, was that intentional in the way you created your persona on stage? Yeah, it, it became intentional, and it be, it was because, uh, you know, I was always like, you know, like most comedians, I was funny to my friends, and I was funny around, uh, but I, I came from a, a educational family. My mother was a school teacher. My mother, my sister was a professor in college, so everybody was, like, into education, and I was funny, but when I saw the late Robin Harris for the first time, is the first time I saw somebody that I considered, like, funny like that and he was relatable to me in the sense that he he looked he performed like an uncle like a cousin he wasn't you know eddie murphy had the leather suits and he was a star you can just look and see he was a yeah, star it almost felt like Rich, the jokes were being thrown away the yeah whole time. yeah exactly and, and when i saw that you can actually do it and make it as that energy i i, I locked into that's who that's how i feel and I, i'm able to perform best when i walk up feeling like just like a like a guy talking to your friends, and when I when I saw that style that he got, that it became a way that I approached comedy for sure. You have a white fan base that rocks with you hard, but you ain't never altered or changed anything. And I feel like part of the brilliance of what you do is that it is a moment of discovery for a white audience member, but a moment of cultural confirmation for a black audience member. Yeah, and like. I just wish people understood how hard it is to just do that, man. Let's take it back to 93. This is BET's Comic View. First off, let's just start with this outfit before we even roll the reel. <laughs> yeah. What is, what's going on with this chain? And what Come flea on, market man. did you get it from? Chain, look, look, man, that chain was made. It used to be, <laughs> so this is me. <laughs> Like, I was like, you know, BT, like being on the show before you got the grandstand, you were on the show. And that gave you a little, uh, just by being on the show, I had TV pull up and I, I was able to kind of make some money touring because I was a comic that was on, you know, that season before I even yeah, won. Comic people change your life overnight. This is before the internet. Overnight. If saw you on Tuesday, you was working what? by Thursday night. And so... Uh, it was a dude in St. Louis that made jewelry. I knew him. He was kind of a, a friend. And he, he made that chain for me. The entertainer with diamonds. And it was a blue diamond at the t at the, at the, at the front. You, you couldn't see it. It's on the far side. It was a tell. blue diamond at the top. This is before all, HD. That blue diamond did not come yeah. up in the... 
And I'm assuming they was diamonds. I mean, you know, we did come to find out the dude used to sell people fake jewelry like years later. But that was my first chain, the entertainer, man. I love that chain. All right, this is Seth the Entertainer. This is uh, BET's Comic View 1993. I came out on that Barry White. Yeah, I like that Barry, man. See, I like, I like that old music. See, I like that music. Back then, you understood the song. Songs was like documentaries, like Al Green. See, Al, come on, yeah. Love and happiness. now. See, right there, that's what the song is about. Love <laughs> and happiness. And then I'll tell you, wait a minute. Something going wrong. What's wrong, Al? Somebody's on the phone. What time is it? Three o'clock in the morning. Well, what they doing? Talking about. How she can make it right. You know, you get to ask questions. Ah, hey, what's love? Love him. Yeah. Walking together. Al, is there something wrong with love? Ain't nothing wrong <laughs> with being in love with someone. Hey, oh, hey. What? How many songs? Yeah. How many soul, soul songs did you go through before you found the right one for that joke to work? That that song probably that joke probably came out of me seeing hearing that song on the radio and literally having that that moment like yo he literally explaining to me what I'm supposed to be doing right now I never really <laughs> saw the song as instructional you know so mm -hmm. and, and then that's what kind of led to the process of the joke it probably just me li literally listening to that song one day and hearing it for the first time as Oh, this he telling me what I'm supposed to be thinking. Like he guiding me through this whole song. Are you able to to turn that part of your brain off to still enjoy entertainment? Or is it uh both like parts running at the same time? You can consume media and enjoy it, but then you also have the analytical side of you that's looking for the joke. Yeah, I think that that's definitely how I work for the most part, is that I try to enjoy things, but yeah, inside every moment is the joke that's that's like coming to you, like you know the 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 blessing. You know when you find you, you know your your sense of humor and your discovery. Uh, you know I think like for most comedians, that part of it is happening. I don't like tell a lot of. I'm not a like a constant joke teller, but usually I'm something about a situation is coming off as the humor. And I, and you know, and I can be watching it, and then finding in my own point of view in there, and going, "Oh, that's funny," and then I'll just take it and start to, you know, massage it into what I feel is the the joke in there. Cool. All right, let's keep rolling with our comment here. Black folk love to sing songs loud, and don't know the word, do we? We'll be knowing our word. We'll just break out, you know. That's my jam. I get the beat to my teeth and my top, my thing, my news. I'm a chop ass up to the mob of me and my thing, and my thing. That is my jam, girl. That is that. You be thinking you don't know none of the world. See, it, it's black singers with record deals don't know they songs. Y'all remember Jeffrey Osborne had that song out a couple years ago, the Woo Woo song? Did you ever trip out the first part of that song? Jeff didn't know the words. Jeff up there talking about up. <laughs> when he was on the news, you know he was on the news. Good thing we got. Can you woo, woo, woo? Can you? That's the only part Jeff knew. That boy ain't know that song. Where was this yeah. taped? Because I'm seeing a lot of different fashion in that audience out there. That's Compton, where like the, the old Normandy Casino, where they would actually shoot the show. They just reset it up like a theater um, and you know, for the specials. It, it's very LA proper, but you know, I'm, I'm like really looking at the diversity of the crowd back then. This is what, like, like maybe. 93 or something when it was yeah this is 93 yeah like and it's, it, that's, it's wild that, to even think that it was that diverse of the audience too i don't even really recall that yeah that's that's the one thing i feel like with black comedy even today just with black culture in general that there is a curiosity about you know what they talking about over there oh let me see what they listening to over there oh what they eating over there oh let me you know so yeah. i think there's always 
going to be people that are curious about it, especially when people are doing it, you know, at the at the top of the game, like they were at the time at Comic View. Let's let's jump ahead to the year two thousand. This is Walter Latham presents the Kings of Comedy, directed by Spike Lee. This I think goes back to what I was saying at the top, just about your ability to be able to capture the black experience and use it as a way to unify black people. Um, let, let's let's just watch a little bit of it first. I, I got a million questions. Right. I probably can only ask two, but uh, this is the original Kings of Comedy from the year two thousand. White people get to us, you know, they'll tell with somebody in their damn season. That's because they live by a different creed than we do in life. White people hope things don't go wrong. They will get the usher because they hope things don't happen. They have high hopes. And if they were running a little late tonight, they probably were thinking, oh my God, we're running a little late. Oh my goodness, I hope no one's in our chairs. <laughs> Man, I hope one's, no one's in our seats. I don't want any problems. Bros, we'll never get to Usher. We don't need Usher. Because we don't live by the hope creed. Black people got a totally different creed we live by. It's more computational. It's the wish factor. Black people don't hope. We wish. We wish a mother would be in our seat. We wish. Nah, that's us right there, partner. Four and five. Four and five. Come on now. <laughs> I've been having a good year, though. I was going through some things, though. I didn't realize, too, this year, dog. I got a little year older, and I'm a grown-ass man. Pause right there. Yeah. Yeah. Does it bother you that so many people be running around talking about I'm a grown ass man and I don't feel like they understand that this was the origin point of that statement? Yeah. You know, yeah. You, you, I know you can't get no royalties like from it, but I'm like, yo, that's what said the entertainer. Man, you know, when, when, when Paris Hilton started registering stuff like that's hot and and, and you know, and, and qualifying people like start registering like catchphrases. I'm like, dude, I got 50 million of them that they should be getting checks for. It's every time I, I hear it, I'm like, I wonder if they know where that came from. Real quick, how much was this suit that you wear? You can tell by the amount of buttons and how long it is that I'm definitely in the Steve click at this point. It's me, <laughs> Steve. That's how I come out. That's how you name people. You're Sir yeah. Steve and Neil. I started doing right. the sleeveless joints because I had so many buttons. I said, look, I'm going to go with it. So I'm the first T.D. Jakes. T.D. Jakes end up stealing this look right here. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Because this, this was my sleeveless suit, I called it, because it was longer than a regular vest, but it was a suit that had the lapel and had everything. And it was, this was in my mind. I designed mm -hmm. this. I love how you just picked your suit regardless of what the background of the stage was going to be. You just like, I don't give a fuck if the stage is blue. I'm wearing blue also. If you remember Kings of Comedy, I had two suits and they both yeah. was blue. <laughs> All right, let's keep rolling with uh, Kings of Comedy. You realize that player when you realize you're a grown ass man, just can't do little things no more. Dog, you grown ass man, dog, you don't play, you don't play games with people, dog. You don't play, you know, you know, black people got all these little nicknames and stuff. Y'all hear them on the shout out. You hear me calling on the radio, doing the shout out, talking about I won't give it up to my little homie, little pistol starter, uh, my little dog, stomach ache. I met this brother the other day, brother, brother named Daryl. He gonna tell me, everybody call him delicious. <laughs> Time I say it, you can just call me delicious. <laughs> <Dude>. <laughs> Man, dog. A grown ass man, dog. <laughs> Angry, call no lover, dude. Delicious. <laughs> what if they way down the street or something? Delicious. Yo, true. <laughs> yo, yo, D, hold up, dude. The fact that that joke is twenty years old and it still rides today. Like, yeah. syllable for syllable, still stands up. That's the thing that you try to look for in jokes. Like, when, you, especially when you kind of had your brand, you look for things, theoretically, that you go, like, this is my unique point of view. And then hopefully it's such a uh, a thing about, you know, culture, people, whatever, that it, it has the ability to ride. What was that time like uh, touring with Kings of Comedy? Because, like, just in terms of fan interaction, because black people show love in a number of different ways. Like I've opened for white comics and they've had fans come up 
and bring them baked goods or weed brownies and stuff like that. Because there's always someone backstage like, you need to come to my car wash tomorrow. Uh, motherfucker, I flew. Yes. You know, like, it, it's the people that bring you, I always say this, like, people, of course, you know, and especially at this time, way bigger dude, I'm like, and people just want to feed me everywhere I go. You know, you go anywhere south. We shot this in North in uh, Charlotte, North sure, Carolina. Yeah. So anywhere south, you know, all the ladies going to show up. I see you like me and bring you big troughs of food that I'm like, you know, babe, I can't take this on the airplane. You know, I, what, I can't, I, I got this chain on as it is. There's no way I'm going to get all this aluminum foil. Well, when I tell you, we love you and we appreciate you. I can't thank you enough for just making a little bit of time uh, to come yeah. on the show. Uh, we look forward to the next comedy special whenever it's safe to get yes, on sir. stage again. I'm a big fan of yours for the same very reason that you say you're just a solid dude. Your comedy is always unique. Uh, your perspective is always fun, and, and you and you just bring your own grownness to it. And then, and even on your advocacy, you've been really uh, powerful and dope and, and and amazing in these in these days of stuff that's going on. All these things are, are, are is what's needed all around. And and, and I think that this is a great way to display um, our humor and what you know how it comes about and, 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 and introducing people, newer generations to even guys like me, and then of course the younger guys too. But People who don't know me as a stand-up, I had these kids come over. My kids' friends didn't know I was a stand-up. They was like, yo, you know any famous comedians? And they was like, no. Nah. And then they was like, aren't you friends with Lucky's dad? And then and then they like went through all the stuff and realized like, oh, wow. Yeah. I only know you as Lucky's dad. I never realized you the dude that's in the movies and that's crazy. So that was wild. It's almost like that Will Smith shit where you have to convince people he used to be a rapper. Yeah. And like, you talk to the young, it's like, he didn't rap on it. Like, Trust me, he was a rapper. Yeah. A popular rapper with big songs. All right, man. Yeah. We'll do. All right, well then we gotta get you on yeah. TikTok to fix that problem. Oh so. yeah, that's, that's, that's my next move. <laughs> <laughs> Always evolving, man. Well brother, thank you so much for coming on. Right so. up. All right, What's man, up? salute to y'all, appreciate it, man. Yep. I'll holler.